Picture this, you are floating in space, gazing down at our blue planet. It looks perfectly round, doesn't it? But hold on, our Earth is not a perfect sphere. It is an oblate spheroid, which means it's slightly squashed at the poles and bulging at the equator. Imagine spinning a water balloon. The faster it spins, the more it bulges in the middle due to centrifugal force. That's our Earth for you. There are some Earth scientists that go out and try to measure the Earth. What they find is that the acceleration of gravity is actually different at different places on the Earth, which means that the mass of the Earth is not spherical. It's not even close. It's what they call a geoid. The Earth's true shape is even more complex, best described as a geoid. The geoid is like a wonky, lumpy version of a potato. It represents the mean sea level across the globe, undulating due to variation in Earth's gravitational field. It is geographical approximation of the Earth. And I think there are kind of easier way to understand is that if the entire surface of the Earth is kind of a liquid and there were no wind or tides, but with the gravitational field and the rotation of the earth, it is the shape that the earth would take. Now that we are talking about covering the entire earth with liquid water, imagine standing on a beach watching the waves gently lap at your feet. You see, the water rises and comes very close and then it falls and goes away very far. The average height of those waves over a long period, accounting for tides and weather, is what we call mean sea level. It's a crucial baseline used for measuring elevations and sea depths. Even though it fluctuates slightly due to tides, currents, atmospheric pressure and salinity, it provides a consistent reference point for us surveyors. But as geoid and mean sea level greatly depends on gravity, you must know that the gravity is not constant everywhere on Earth. Somewhere it is lumpy with huge mountain ranges and in some places we have miles deep of oceans. The material mass distribution on Earth is not even and as gravity depends on mass, we have fluctuating gravity. To put it simply, the equatorial bulge and the effects of the surface centrifugal force due to rotation mean that the Sea level gravity increases from about 9.780 meter per second square at the equator to about 9.832 meter per second square at the poles. So an object will weigh approximately 0.5% more at the poles than at the equator. Gravity is greater closer to the earth center. Farther you go away from the earth center, the gravity decreases. For everyday people like you and me, the slight increase and decrease of our weight will go unnoticed. But for people who wants to measure the earth surface, this is a big problem. People like surveyors, cartographers, map makers, they will need a smooth reference surface, a standard mathematical surface on which they can measure and create a map. So as a child, I learned that it was Columbus who discovered that the world was not flat. But they should have told me about Erastothens, the Greek scholar of the 3rd century BC, great scientist and father of geography, who was able to not only determine that the earth was not flat, but also to measure the circumference of the earth within a reasonable degree of accuracy. To map the earth accurately, we need to simplify its complex shape. So enter spheroids and ellipsoids. These are mathematical shapes that approximate the geoid. Now, ellipsoid is essentially a stretched sphere. It is sometimes called an oblate spheroid, meaning a flat sphere that has been flattened at the poles due to earth rotation. It's not really a perfect ellipsoid because mass is distributed unevenly within the planet as we discussed earlier. But think of it this way. An ellipsoid makes the math easier while maintaining reasonably accurate estimate. The ellipsoid is meant to be centered with the predicted center of earth. Now, there are two main parameters for an ellipsoid. 
radius at the equator also known as semi major axis and radius at the pole also known as semi minor axis and combining them together we get a flattening parameter you know the most widely used spheroid today is the wgs84 or world geodetic system 1984 wgs84 is an ellipsoid with a semi major radius of 6778 km at the equator and semi minor radius of 6356 km and a flattening of 1 by 298 decimal 257 and some change so you see the radius at the pole is almost 22 km shorter than the radius at the equator now this wgs84 is an earth centered earth fixed terrestrial reference system So it is based on a consistent set of constants and model parameters that describes the earth size, shape and gravity as geomagnetic fields. Just so you know that these datums are not fixed and they are being updated almost constantly. As our technology improves, we can accurately measure tiniest variation of gravity on earth surface and we update our gravity models like earth gravitational model 2008 or egm 2008 so this wga 34 it is the backbone of gps technology guiding everything from your car's navigation system to search and rescue operations while it's not perfect match to the geoid it's close enough for most practical applications speaking of practical applications let's talk about datums a datum is like a reference point or a framework that helps us map the earth surface the word datum is taken from latin which means something given like it's a given fact or proven fact fascinating history isn't it there are two main types of datums horizontal and vertical horizontal datums provide a reference frame for measuring positions on earth surface they account for the planet's shape size and the position of key points examples include nad83 or the north american datum 1983 and the wgs84 both these datums are based on something called geodetic reference system of 1980 or grs80 wgs84 uh, differs slightly with grs80 in flattening Now this WGS84 is the global datum and our GPS system also works on this datum. These datums are essential for creating accurate maps and navigation system. WGS84 provides a consistent reference frame for the entire world. They are great for global application like GPS. Though WGS84 is the best fit for the entire earth, there are certain mismatch in some areas. mismatch in the sense that the wgs84 does not exactly match with geoid or gravity models in some of these areas so good people in those areas have come up with the local datums which provide more localized accuracy than a global datum might for example everest 1830 is the local datum for the indian subcontinent but you might ask what does this datums do a practical example would be say you have a car navigation system and in that map it shows you a point position a position where you are on this earth if you have another point position where you want to go then the system will calculate the distance and direction to go based on the accessible road so what are these points these are coordinate systems based on wgs84 datum It simply tells you where you are on the surface of the earth. Ah well it's not that simple as it sounds. In our school we learned about planar coordinate systems like uh, find the point A if the x value is 2 and the y value is 3. So in your graph grid paper you will draw a horizontal line and a vertical line and assume the conjunction point of these two lines are zero. Horizontal line represents x axis and the vertical line represents y axis so you move two units in horizontal direction and three units in vertical direction and you find your point a the coordinate system is exactly the same except the vertical direction lines are not parallel like in the graph grid paper 
horizontal lines are parallel but the vertical lines are converging at the poles and that's not all the assumed center of this coordinate reference system is at the center of the earth and that's the reason we call this earth centered earth fixed or ecef coordinate system these lines are called latitude and longitude lines horizontal lines are latitude lines and vertical lines going from pole to pole are called longitude lines and the value are in angles on the earth surface these lines do meet and we do have a surface zero point but to get to the zero point we need to have a horizontal zero line and a vertical zero line right the horizontal zero line of the zero latitude line is assumed to be the equator so the equator line is dividing the earth uh, mathematically of course in two hemisphere north and south the vertical zero line or the zero longitude line is assumed to run through the royal observatory of greenwich which was first established by sir george airy in 1851 the concept of vertical zero line is not new though the notion of longitude was first developed by erastothenes Alexandria mathematician Ptolemy was the first to describe it to run through the Canary group of islands. This vertical line was earlier used to find the standard time and fascinatingly one of the earliest known description of standard time in India appeared in the 4th century CE in an astronomical treatise Surya Siddhanta. Postulating a spherical earth, the book described the thousand years old customs of the prime meridian or zero longitude as passing through Avanti, the ancient name for the historic city of Ujjain and Rohitaka, the ancient name for Rotak, a city near Kurukshetra. Again, a fascinating history, isn't it? But that's history. Now in 1984, at the International Meridian Conference in Washington, D.C., 22 countries voted to adopt the Greenwich Meridian as the prime meridian of the world. The French people, of course, argued for a neutral line, but eventually abstained and continued to use the Paris Meridian until 1911. But you might notice that if you check the coordinates at the location in today's map, you will find that the longitude is not exactly zero at the Royal Observatory. The prime meridian line today sits at 5.31 arc seconds west. So why? Why is that? Well, the world geodetic system of 1984 defines a slightly different prime meridian. And this is the system that we use today and that's about 5.31 arc seconds or 102.5 meters east of Greenwich Meridian. And this is known as the IRS Reference Meridian which stands for International Earth Rotation and Reference System Services. No, nobody wanted to mess with the British. With satellite technology, we can get very accurate measurements of the Earth's gravity. Satellites change the reference from the surface of the Earth to its center of mass, around which all satellites orbit. The change in prime meridian was caused by the requirement that satellite-based geodetic reference systems be centered on the center of the mass of the Earth. And due to the shift of tectonic plates, the prime meridian slowly shifts as well. So we got our prime meridian and we have our equator based on which we can now determine our position on the surface of the earth, right? Mm, not so fast. We have established that the earth isn't flat, but it's not exactly round either, and nor it is a perfect sphere. And it turns out that it's bumpy, lumpy, and rather oddly shaped, and there is this uneven distribution of mass on our planet. And the greater the concentration of the mass, the greater the gravitational pull. And you see this uh, longitude lines gets narrower as we go towards the pole. At the equator, one arc minute of longitude is one nautical mile or about 1852 meter. But as you go towards the pole, one arc minute of longitude is still one nautical mile 
but the actual distance on the ground decreases a lot and that's a big problem if you need to measure and define a distance. So now we have a great requirement of converting this lumpy, bumpy, uneven, roundish earth into a legible, measurable 2D map or chart. How do we do that? Let's now explore the fascinating history of cartography. Humans have been drawing maps for thousands of years. One of the earliest known maps dates back to ancient Babylon about 600 BC. Fast forward to ancient Greece where scholars like Ptolemy developed sophisticated methods for projecting the carved earth onto flat surfaces. During the age of exploration in the 15th and 16th centuries, maps became essential tools for navigators like Christopher Columbus and Ferdinand Magellan. The invention of the printing press in the 15th century allowed maps to be mass produced, revolutionizing how we view the world. One fun fact, early explorers often filled the uncharted territories with fanciful illustration of sea monsters and mythical lands. Let's talk about flattening the globe. You know, flattening a 3D globe onto a 2D map is not easy fit. It's like trying to peel an orange and lay the peel flat without tearing it. This process called map projection always involves some distortion. Let's explore a few common projections. There are mainly three different ways to project a 3D surface on a 2D plane. One of them is a cylindrical projection. In this projection, you wrap the earth around in a cylinder and put a light bulb at the center of the earth and project the surface features on the cylinder. You then cut open the cylinder and put it flat. Now I'm not asking you to go and buy a huge reel of paper and wrap it around earth. Well, theoretically you can do that, but then you have to go to the center of the earth to light the bulb. As far as I know, there is no electricity at the center of the earth. So you can't light a bulb there. These are all mathematical. There are great scientists and it's their job to light the bulb for you. Next is a conic projection where you put a cone on the earth, keeping the top of the cone aligned with the pole and cover the entire earth. And the third one is the azimuthal projection where you put a plain paper on top of the globe and project the features on that sheet. This projection is useful for polar maps showing the earth from above or below. It's handy for planning air routes over poles. Now there are many different variations of this projection and every projection have their own advantages and disadvantages. First is marketer projection. It's a cylindrical projection. This is famous for preserving angles and shapes, making it great for navigation. However, it distorts size, especially near the poles. Have you ever wondered why the Greenland looks gigantic on the maps? That's the marketer projection at work. Next is the Robinson projection designed to create visually appealing maps. The Robinson projection strikes a balance between size and shape distortion. It's often used for world maps in classroom and atlases. And then there is Gould's homolocyne projection. This projection looks like an orange peel laid flat. This minimizes distortion in area but making it challenging for navigation. One particularly nifty system is the universal transverse marketer projection. It's almost same as the cylindrical marketer projection but here the cylinder is wrapped around horizontally such that one of the meridian touches the cylinder. So we can call it a transverse cylindrical projection. It divides the earth into 60 zones, generally about 6 degrees wide in longitude. Because it's a transverse projection, each one of these zones will have a true scale along the meridian. And with that in mind, it's not really just one projection. It's actually a multiple projection, 60 different projections. Because each of these zones have its own projection and each one of these zones is aligned with the cylinder. So when we unwrap the cylinder, the meridian or the longitude lines are straight and parallel. 
This is almost like the planar graph coordinate system that we used in our schools. Now the surveys can map the world more accurately and we can navigate more accurately. So there you have it guys. From the oblate spheroid shape of the earth to the intricacies of datum and projection, we have covered a lot of ground today. Understanding these concepts not only help us appreciate the complexity of our planet, but also the ingenuity of the scientists and the cartographers who have worked tirelessly to map it. Thank you, Mr. Avajit, for taking us on this fascinating history. And thank you to our listeners. Tune in next time for another episode of Wanderings Through History and Science. Until then, stay curious and keep exploring.